Welcome to Cabrillo Marine Aquarium's Virtual Ichthyology Sea Search. My name is Alfonso. I'm a full-time educator at the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium. Let's get started with the class. What is ichthyology? It is the study of fishes. There are more than 33,000 species of fishes worldwide. More than 1,300 of the known species live off of our coast from Alaska to Baja, California. What makes a fish a fish? If an organism has these three things, then it is a fish. First off, gills are needed for breathing. These animals live underwater. They need to remove oxygen from the water and release carbon dioxide back into its environment. They also need vertebrae. The backbone is used to protect the spinal cord and muscles are attached to it as well. Fins are used for stability, steering, and propulsion. We will explain these further in the next slide. The dorsal fins, anal fin, and pelvic fins are used for stability. Pectoral fins are used for steering. They are large in slower moving fish and small in faster moving fish. The caudal fin is the fin used for propulsion. There are different caudal fin shapes. Forked tail fins or caudal fins are our fastest and the larger squared off fins are generally the slowest. Fin shape and size can help us determine where fish live and how they interact with their surroundings. Why do fish school? Protection is one of those reasons. The higher the number of fish in a school, the lower the chances of an individual fish being eaten. Feeding is another important reason for schooling. The more pairs of eyes and nostrils you have searching for food in a group, the better the chances for the group to find food. Reproduction is also a very important reason for schooling. Most of the species of fish that school are spawning fish. That means they release sperm and egg into the water, allowing it to mix and float away in the currents. This ensures their reproductive success. Here are three examples of fish that are able to camouflage in their surroundings. On the top left, we have an image of a giant kelp fish. Its coloration, size, and shape allows it to hide in and among the kelp blades in the kelp forest. On the lower left, we have a California halibut. They lie on the bottom on the sediment and are able to closely match the color by changing color of their skin. The cabazon is able to hide in and among the algae growing on the bottom of the rocky inner tidal. Camouflage provides protection from predators and it also allows them to hide from potential prey. These animals are excellent ambush predators. Fish are a very diverse group of organisms. All of the fish you see pictured here are a different size, shape, and coloration. However, they are all fish. Their morphology can help us figure out the habitat they call home. We will be discussing two classes of fish, the class Actinopterygii and the class Chondrichthys. Actinoterygii is a class of ray-finned bony fishes. We will cover a few species that call Southern California home. The California sheephead are wrasses that live in the kelp forest. They feed on sea urchins and various crustaceans. They are a keystone predator that keep populations of sea urchins under control. They exhibit sexual dimorphism. The males look different than the females. The males have a black face, white chin, pink middle, and black caudal area. The females have a white chin and pink body. They live in groups of one male to many females. If the male is removed from the group, the females that remain will compete with each other. The competition 
is to find out which female is the largest. They will open their mouths at each other, and once the largest female is determined, she will get a chance to change into a male. Giant sea bass can reach over 7 feet long and weigh up to 650 pounds. They live in the kelp forest and rocky reefs. Due to their large size, they were overfished for a long time and their population was greatly impacted. They are listed internationally as a critically endangered species and are now protected in California. They reach maturity at 11 to 13 years of age and their population is slowly recovering. Cabrillo Marine Aquarium is doing its part by raising baby giant sea bass. Last summer, 180 juveniles were released into local waters. With continued protection and monitoring, these fish will have the opportunity to recover their numbers. California scorpion fish live in kelp forests and rocky reefs. Their body shape, large pectoral fins, and coloration tells us they live along the bottom. They are known to have venomous spines and use them along with their ability to camouflage as protection from potential predators. Their ability to camouflage also allows them to be great ambush predators. The Garibaldi is the California state marine fish. They are one of our resident damselfish species that live in the kelp forest. The males build nests with red algae to attract females. Once a female finds a nest that she likes, she will deposit her eggs and then the male will immediately chase her away. Each nest will have eggs from many females, but will only be fertilized by the male guarding the nest. When the eggs hatch, the juveniles will have blue spots and the males will protect them. Once they lose the blue spots, the males will see them as competition and chase them away. Luckily for them, they reach a viable size by the time they lose their blue spots. California grunion are silver sides that have developed an interesting way to protect their young. During the months of February to July, three to four days after each new moon and full moon, these fish exit the water and lay their eggs in the sand. This is called a grunion run. The females will bury themselves up to their pectoral fins and lay between 300 and 3,000 eggs. The males will wrap themselves around a female, deposit their milk, and fertilize the eggs. Both fish will swim back out to sea, and the eggs will remain in the sand for 10 days. They will be ready to hatch when the waves from the next high tide reach them. Let's hatch some grunion eggs. We collect sand with eggs the morning after a grunion run. We keep the sand in the lab under ideal conditions for 10 days so the eggs can fully develop. We then add the sand to a jar and add water to see the eggs. Developed eggs have eyes and should hatch. Swirling the water mimics the waves mixing the sand and the eggs, which triggers the fully developed eggs to hatch. Any undeveloped eggs will not hatch, but will become a food resource for other animals. The California moray eel has a leptocephalus larva and the pectoral fins are absent making it a true eel. Their snake-like body shape and scaleless skin allows them to move freely in between rocks without injury. They have a pharyngeal jaw, which is a second jaw in their throat, to help pull prey in closer. Red rock shrimp and moray eels live together and share a symbiotic relationship. The shrimp remove parasites and dead skin from the eel in exchange, the eel protects the shrimp from potential predators. Are all sharks fish? Yes, they are cartilaginous fishes. The class chondrichthys includes sharks, skates, and rays. Do humans have cartilage? Yes, we have cartilage in our ears, nose, and in our skeletal joints. Swell sharks get their name from the ability to swell with water. Their dorsal fin is set far on their back, allowing them to wedge themselves in between rocks 
so they can escape potential predators. They are a nocturnal species. Females will wrap the tendrils of their eggs around the base of kelp, anchoring them to the bottom. The eggs are well camouflaged with the surrounding kelp. Babies develop in the eggs for nine months to one year. Once the yolk is consumed, they hatch and are ready to hunt for their own food. Horn sharks get their name from the spines that grow in front of their dorsal fins. If a large predator were to bite down on these spines, their mouths would get injured and the horn shark could escape. Horn sharks lay spiral shaped eggs that anchor themselves in between the rocks and algae. They have many rows of tiny sharp teeth that they use for feeding on fish and invertebrates. They are nocturnal and they sleep in between the rocks during the day. Leopard sharks get their name from the pattern of black saddles and spots along their body. They are very active at night. Smaller sharks feed mostly on invertebrates, while larger sharks eat mostly fish. They live at least 26 years. Females give live birth and are able to produce between 1 and 37 young per year. Round rays and bat rays have stinging barbs and they can be found in the shallow water along the surf zone. You should always do the stingray shuffle when walking into the ocean. Thornback rays have thorns all along their back to protect them from potential predators. Torpedo rays use their modified kidneys to produce electricity to jolt their prey. It is time to begin with our fish dissection. The fish we are going to dissect is called the Pacific mackerel. Its scientific name is Scomber japonicus. We will begin by discussing the external anatomy. We will be taking a closer look at the morphological characteristics that show us how this fish interacts with its environment. We will then move on to discussing the internal anatomy. We will be taking a closer look at the internal organs and describe their function. This is a schooling fish that lives in the Pacific Ocean, and its coloration indicates that it is an open ocean fish. You can see that this fish is iridescent, and it has a light-colored belly or ventral side and dark-colored back or dorsal side. This is called countershading. The silvery belly mimics light coming from above when looking up, and the back mimics the color of the water when looking down. This allows them to camouflage in the open ocean. They have a very large mouth for their body size. Their teeth are tiny, however, so that indicates that this fish will swallow its food whole. Looking down the throat, you can see the gill rakers, and the two bumps at the back of the throat are palatine teeth, which both help keep their live prey from escaping. This bony plate is called the operculum. It covers and protects the gills. Under the operculum, we find the bright red gills. The gills are used for breathing. They are filled with blood and exchange carbon dioxide and ammonia waste with oxygen from their surroundings. There are four gill arches on each side. The fish will swim through the water, opening its mouth and allow water to flow over the gills for the exchange to take place. The first gill arch has gill rakers. They are bony extensions that are used to protect the gills. They also prevent the live prey from escaping through the operculum opening. After removing the first gill arch, you can see that any live prey could escape through this opening. Where the gill arch is intact, you can see it creates a barrier, preventing the escape of live prey. This is a very important adaptation that ensures survival by funneling live prey to the back of the throat and eventually the stomach. 
The eyes of this fish are large, indicating that they are a visual predator. They not only use their eyes to look for prey, but they also use them to avoid predation. Looking closely at the skin of this fish, you can see a faint pattern of scales. The scales are small, indicating that this is a fast swimming fish. The shape of this fish also tells us that it is a fast swimming fish. This fish is a football or torpedo shape, also known as a fusiform shape. The body is very hydrodynamic and the middle is muscular, allowing it to move its forked tail rapidly. This propels the mackerel through the water at a very fast pace. The pectoral fins are used for steering. They are small in this species, once again indicating that, that this is a fast swimming open ocean fish. Here is the spiny dorsal fin. The spiny dorsal fin fits in a groove on the back of this fish, which allows the Pacific mackerel to become even more streamlined by tucking in its dorsal fin. As it increases its speed, the fish may begin to spiral. They can then lift the first dorsal fin and the second dorsal fin and are able to stabilize their movement. They also use the pelvic fins and the anal fin to keep their body from spiraling. They have paired nostrils in front of their eyes. They are U-shaped tubes that have olfactory cells at the base. As water moves through them, they can perceive scent. They have a lateral line that runs along both sides of the fish. In this species, it is found where the dark color of the back of the fish transitions to the lighter color of the belly. It is a sensory system that allows them to sense the movement of water around them. It consists of a canal with a series of pores that allows water to move over modified hair cells. When the hair cells move, a signal is sent to the brain and the fish will change direction. When fish school, they are able to move together in unison to avoid predation. The lateral line system is what allows them to do that. Now we will begin our internal dissection. We need to make a few cuts to get a look inside of this fish. We can begin the incision by using the natural opening the vent. I will insert the scissors and cut along the belly, lifting the tip of the scissors so I don't damage the internal organs. When I get to the pelvic fins, there is a bone called the pelvic girdle. I'll cut through that and continue all the way up to the head. Then I'll insert the scissors into the vent, cutting each side of the fish. I'll also cut each side of the gill cavity to create a window into the fish. I will now open up the fish to get a closer look at the internal organs. There are two large flesh colored organs that are taking up a lot of space inside this fish. These paired organs are the gonads, and the flesh color and smooth texture tells us that this fish is a male. These are the testes of this fish. If this fish was female, it would have veiny, orange-colored ovaries with a grainy texture. I will reach in and remove each of the testes, separating the connective tissue that hold them in place. The size of these paired organs tells us that this species is spending a large portion of its energy for reproduction. These fish are spawners, meaning that they release sperm and eggs into the water column during reproduction. Now that the gonads are out, we can get a closer look at the remaining organs inside of the fish. The first organ we will look at is the heart. 
Fish have a two-chambered heart. It consists of an atrium, which collects the deoxygenated blood, and the ventricle, which pumps the blood toward the gills from the atrium. This dark red rubbery triangular shaped organ is the ventricle. The ventricle is a strong muscle that is always pumping blood through the body. The atrium sits above the ventricle and does not come out intact. The flesh colored section attached to the ventricle is the bulbous arteriosus. It maintains a steady flow of blood into the gill system. The next organ we will be looking at is the liver. The liver is used to store fats and carbohydrates and produces bile, a solution that emulsifies or breaks down fats in the intestine. It also serves as a blood filter by destroying old blood cells and maintaining proper blood chemistry, and aids in nitrogen waste removal. It is a spongy tissue that sits below the heart. We sometimes find parasitic worms on the liver but this one appears to not have them. This organ with spaghetti-like projections that sits below the liver is called the pyloric cica. It secretes enzymes to aid in digestion. The next organ that we are getting a closer look at is the stomach. I'll cut the stomach out and squeeze the contents into this container. These are undigested scales that remain from this animal's last meal. Since Pacific mackerel swallow their prey whole, I hoped that we would find a whole fish. Unfortunately, that was not the case this time. I am not certain of which species of fish that these scales are from. However, there are ichthyologists whose job it is to analyze stomach content and would be able to identify fish to species using only these scales. The swim bladder is the last thing to remove from the inside of the body cavity. It traps gas inside of the fish and allows it to become neutrally buoyant. It will be able to float without using up energy. We are now going to get a closer look at what is inside of the eye. The clear cover over the eye is the cornea. I will need to insert the end of the scissors directly into the eye through the cornea. Opening the scissors and giving them a little twist will create an opening for the lens to be removed. Applying pressure on the sides of the opening will allow the lens and the gel-like humor to come out. The hard lens is inside of a clear gel. Once removed, you are left with this hard lens. It appears white because it was frozen. The lens is clear in a living fish. We have reached the end of the virtual ichthyology sea search. We hope that you enjoyed the class. Thank you for watching.